let's just start at the beginning. Um, how did uh, Perimeter Records start? How did you guys meet? I ended up going to work for an engineering company that Chris already worked for, and uh, we both were drafters back in the early 80s. And that's how we met, actually, with working together. Somewhere inside the perimeter of Atlanta? It was actually off Roswell Road in Sandy Springs. It was right, at, right adjacent to the interstate. And uh, anyone who lives in Atlanta knows what the perimeter is. It's an interstate that runs all the way around Atlanta. And not only did Robert and I work just inside the perimeter, but uh, I lived length of a football field from there. And Robert, unfortunately, had a long drive. He had to drive all the way up from McDonald. But we took that name because we were out at the perimeter. And it also meant mainstream music as opposed to music from out at the perimeter. So you were both already recording, and then yeah. so as you're talking, you're, you kind of came up with the idea that maybe you could uh, record, record together. There was a show I was playing at with some other people, not Robert, but he found out about it one day. We were talking at work, and so he came down to, to the show. And uh, at the end of the show, I remember talking to Robert outside. I turned this idea over my mind. If you want to get something played, you can do it yourself. And that was when I started thinking about the idea of Perimeter Records. I talked to Robert. We were both employed. We both had very, uh, we had disposable income, uh, money to spend. So I thought if we pooled our resources that we could uh, get something done. Okay, well, how did the first few sessions come about? Did you go over to some your house, I guess, for instance, or? Uh, we would, we would, I would actually show up at Chris's apartment, and uh, we we started doing demos on a Fostex multi-tracker. Okay. And uh, Chris had a couple of synthesizers. I had a synthesizer, and I I never was really a keyboard player before, but I like to mess around on a synthesizer. I'm a guitar player at heart, but, uh, and so we started putting demos together and, uh, we learned a few tricks with the Fostec because you could do backward tape loops with that. Okay. And we so, kind of took that idea. So you had some experimentation in, right. in your own demo uh, recordings. That right. You probably transferred that when you went to record it officially, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So when, when you first started recording, did you anticipate that that was towards producing an album, or did that idea come later after you had a few songs? I, I don't really remember when that idea. I, I know me and Chris wanted to get our music out there, and at the time, CDs <clears throat> were just becoming new. I mean, I, I didn't know that much about it. You couldn't hardly find a whole lot of CDs. It was still vinyl. And cassettes. You couldn't so, produce CDs on your own at that time. No, we couldn't do press. that. And, uh, and I was kind of fascinated with the fact that uh, doing a vinyl record. Okay. I wasn't. I was didn't, didn't know anything about the process, so it was, I was kind of you know eager to get involved in something like that. As was Chris. Okay. So that leads to my next question. You know, which which came first, the idea of the label or having an album, and now you've got to release it. Well, I think we started first with with getting together and recording things that we liked, enjoyed playing, and possibly playing out live. And then I think the second thing was forming Perimeter Records. And, okay. Well, the, the, the forming the label was so we could promote our own recording. Okay. Yeah. yeah so it was a promotional tool. It was a way. I, to, I never expected. And I think Robert agreed with me that we never thought we were going to make a lot of money. That it was, if for us and for other local musicians that we knew, it was a tool 
to get our music to people that wouldn't otherwise hear it. Okay. And that was what was much more important to us than any amount of money that we were going to make from sales. So you were sinking a lot of your own money into the project. A lot of money. It was our, it was our own money. We didn't. Uh, that's why everything, if you look at everything, it's just produced by both of us because we, it was our money that was going into all of it. Right. Yeah. So, um, but we did we did reach out to the Secretary of State's office and to be able to use the name Perimeter Records. They actually did a research and sent us a certification saying we could officially call ourselves Perimeter Records. No one else was using that at the time now. I don't know if that's the same now. But they not. actually, uh, you were able to we get a got business a license. We certificate from the Secretary of State's office and we got a business license. $50 a year, and, uh, every year, for the business license. But we wanted to make sure that our mailing address was the city of Atlanta, not where I lived in Henry County. And I think Chris's address might have actually been city of Atlanta. It might have been Sandy Springs. So we, we got a post office box with the city of Atlanta as our is our uh, address so people from around the world or whoever got our product they were they knew we were from atlanta not from some city they'd never heard of okay so that the business is fully established uh right from the get-go and uh the process of adding inventory to the label begins that's right So it was 1986 when the first album, ISO, came out. Um, from start to finish, how long did that process take to record it and, and get it in the finished vinyl form? You know, we did demos all that summer, well, a long I, time before we went to record. We, we put demos together of the entire yeah. album. Yeah. Every so, song. A multi-tracker. So you got a chance to listen to the flow and the se sequencing of it. Arrange the songs. Yeah, and then, and then when we were ready when we went into the studio. We, we spent two days recording on the 8-track. Back then it was a reel-to-reel 8-track. And then we spent two days mixing it onto the 2-track stereo. Okay. And, and, then, and the two days was a four-hour afternoon. So we spent eight hours to record it and eight hours to mix it down. Total. Right. It wasn't like it was. Do you, you recall know, the studio to, that you did that work in? Yeah, Transmedia Studios. I don't know if they're still Real around. Nice they were out off, off Thornton Road near Douglasville. Oh, right okay, there. over on the west side. Of town. Right on the west side. Okay, and um, so they produced a uh, master two track. Uh, do you have possession of that? Or? I don't know if I still. I think I do have the master two track of ISO. Yeah, okay, so uh, most of them were first takes, as I understand it. Yeah, pretty much. In the but studio, pretty much. That's I yeah. can remember because Chris and myself had already ha had well rehearsed it. We, and and, and, unless, it, and we, had, we wanted to, one thing Chris and my, me wanted to do was limit the amount of studio time, obviously because it was costing money. money. Right. <laughs> and so it was costing nice. us money, not somebody else's money. So yeah. the whole plan going into it was... Let's get it done. Not that we didn't want to craft it to be as good as it could be. We wanted to be as good as it could be to start with. Okay. Just to limit the amount of redos, which well, there weren't a lot. Right, that's good. Right? Un unless uh, something, a uh, mic stand fell right. over or some, you know. So you, you're capturing the spontaneity yeah, when you get we them We pretty much just, and... we would start the song, record it, end it, and it was done. Pedestrian, if you listen to it, to me, I feel like I'm driving in traffic downtown Atlanta or any other metropolitan area where you're go, 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 and then stop. But when you stop, there's still sound going on. Then you go, 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 and stop. So if you listen to Pedestrian, you hear all this percussion and all these great synthesizer noises, and then, and then when it stops, you hear 
sirens, you hear horns, you oh, hear... The cacophony of living I had a synthesizer. I could make sound like a helicopter, and I made it sound... We would get that to go from one channel to the other, so it actually sounded like a helicopter was flying over. I've lived, at this point, 40 years in Atlanta, and anyone who's lived a short time in Atlanta knows that the traffic is not fun. And to me, that song will always be a, a, a pretty much a way of saying, welcome to Atlanta. <laughs> stumbled on a technique when we were doing the demo tapes with the multi-tracker that if you took that cassette and put it in upside down or on the other side, but you still had the same track playing, it, it would actually run a tape loop. It ran it in reverse. Okay. And so we had recorded me speaking words, and then when we, we had intended it to be run where you understood every word I said. Well, when we were doing the demo, I put the tape in backwards and it started playing back the words in reverse. And we went, wow, that that's sounds great. really, really <laughs> cool. Great. So in the studio, not only were we running it in reverse, the studio engineer was changing the pitch of my voice. So I'm speaking backwards, but I'll be speaking real, real low and then real, real high. And, when, and if you have a vinyl record player and you have this album, don't turn the record player on, but sit your stylus on it and spin it backwards with your finger, and then you'll know the secret. <laughs> oh, okay. You can understand the words I'm speaking. On the album. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, you, you have the record complete, and now you have to market it. How did you go about uh, getting your record out there? This is the pre-internet. Boy, this is, you said it, this is pre-internet, and it was tough. We, you know, we tried to take out ads in magazines, we got some reviews, we got some airplay, and it, the airplay and the reviews and all, it just seemed to build, and it got better and better. With each record right. we did, it got better and better. And we were really lucky, but boy, if we had had the internet back then, it would have been so much uh, easier. Chris did a lot of hard work on that in, in, in the way that he reached out to college radio stations all across this country. There's actually a map that exists showing every, every radio station that was getting copies of our records. A lot of those college radio stations had us on their playlist. They would send us back to playlists and then we would see where we were on their playlist. Okay, so you're getting some feedback. We were getting, getting feedback. Getting yep. They would send us letters back. They would send Chris letters back appreciating the records. The source uh, for radio stations came from the uh, Music Journal. College Music Journal, CMJ. And I remember one chart, uh, Doug, you'll get a kick out of this. Uh, the first al album we did, ISO, actually was in the charts a higher position at one point than uh, Frank Zappa's Jazz from Hell. Oh my goodness. And I, I think that, that Robert and I recording an album for $400 in Atlanta could have a, a higher chart position than somebody like Frank Zappa, who is a genius, you know, uh, 
that that was really great to see know, something. I think that like. says that your music was of its time. It was very contemporary. It, 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 at times, it, it was so encouraging to see something like that happen. Uh, I, I never expected things right. like I that. Would, I would read. <laughs> I would read inter uh, articles in magazines and get, shake my head, going, "Wow, really? It's just me and Chris, right?" Yeah. 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 <laughs> there you go. So with the with the uh, information you're getting back from the radio stations, that kind of buoyed you on to, to do more, I guess. And did that how oh. soon did that lead into the creation of your second album? Uh, we, we did the second album pretty quick. Um, uh, the whole thought with the second album though was Chris was a big Harry Parch fan, and I actually I owned the book myself called The Genesis of Music, and Harry Parch was a composer that decided to start building his own instruments. Some of them are actually beautiful, but they look like pieces of art. And so Chris started out, uh, I think the, uh, the Zomerzil was the, I think was the very first one. I was building in 83. I started building uh, instruments in 83, three years before we recorded the first album. So I had a whole orchestra of instruments built by the time we started recording. Now, ISO had a mix of home-built instruments yep. and store-bought, um, as you mentioned, synthesizers, uh, and standard guitars, I guess, maybe? Or, yeah. Okay. DC yeah. Rich. But, um, so, but the second album, um, Music for Home-Built Instruments, was entirely devoted to Chris's home-built instruments. That's right. Well, Chris, Chris had a large number of of instruments, and not only a large number of instruments, some of them were very large instruments. And I, at the time, lived uh, with my wife, who I had just married, in McDonough, Georgia, and we had a little house on the lake, and that we weren't living in that one. We were, we'd already built another house, so Chris and myself would bring all those instruments down, and that was kind of like our studio. Uh, where we could set them all up, we could rehearse the music together, we could write the music together. We knew there were going to be a lot of overdubs. There had to be because there's only two of us and there were multiple instruments played on some of the songs. So uh, logistically, it was a it was a challenge. Because um, you only got one vehicle to move everything or two? I think we just used the truck. We might have used put some of the smaller stuff in Chris's car. Okay. Well, once we got to the studio to do the recordings, each song required its own mic. The, the studio engineer had to, it was funny, he said, y'all are the only people I've recorded where I actually have to set up the studio for each song uh, because all the, the instruments would be different, new instruments would come in, other instruments would be moved out of the way. Uh, so, so, so mic placement, it was different on each piece of equipment based on its resonant chamber? Also, each of the instruments, there was different dynamic volume levels. So some instruments were very loud, some instruments were very quiet, and we had to balance levels as well as mic placement and moving the instruments in and out. And it was a very, it was, it was a big deal. So to get all of our estimate, how many actual pieces of instruments did you have in the studio at, uh, at one time? 30. 30 pieces. Yeah, 30 probably. plus, man. Wow. Including the big bass marimba. No, oh, some large, uh, some of them are very BBC large. Rack. Rack. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but more, the glass more, rack, more than the 30. Glass rack. Okay, so I can see where that would be a nightmare for uh, some engineers. Who, who was the engineer on that project? Uh, his name was Hugh Herrer. He actually ran that studio. It was called Transmedia Studios. Okay. The same one that and, and we did the first and second album. That's right. Both with, of those albums with you, with you okay. at Transmedia. So how, he was um, okay with doing the extra work that was necessary to remic every instrument for every song. He was okay with it. He actually got fascinated by it all after we got started because yeah. he looked at it, it was, was a something challenge. new for him too. Yeah, uh, the sounds were different. Uh, I think uh, people are surprised when they hear that they don't understand how good it sounded. Uh, 
and he actually did a little bit of treatment on the sure. sounds He's, yeah. to give some echo, maybe a little reverb or so something. So starting with high quality yeah, microphones uh, and, and, right, and placement and, uh, is the key. And, and that's then, why when people listen to the, the album today, they just like, wow, that's home built instruments. So. <laughs> yeah, it does change the tone right. maybe a little bit than it would be by itself. But that's but you were literally playing the instruments in real time, and right. we saw occasional the dubs. But um, in some cases, in the in the in the example of your solo piece, where you've got how many overdubs on that piece? Well, piece for stringed instruments. I did that all by myself. Chris wanted to do a percussion piece. He wanted me to do a string piece, and I played. I played a dulcimer. I played a uh, the 36 string zither. I played the dulcimer again with a bow, and then uh, there was one other stringed instrument that escapes me right now. Oh, the two the two string guitar. Okay. Uh, oh, the bass. Played the bass also, and put it all together. As opposed, I had to record each piece of my song individually. You're hearing it back on headphones. Right. And, uh, Standard exactly. headphones, listening to the previous track. I do remember yeah. playing the dulcimer. I was not in the studio. I was in the control room with the engineer. And because this was a home-built electric instrument, it didn't necessarily have the best shielding in the world. So <laughs> he had me sit on a stool that swiveled. And he would have me turn on that stool till he got the sound exactly right. That's great. Yeah, because it was trying to do a little signal feedback thing. Uh -huh. But and I ended up, I ended up being turned 180 degrees around, facing a wall. But, he found but a I was in the spot. control center, and right. he said, "Just keep turning it right there. Don't move. Play it right there." The piece that I did for solo percussionist was based on a piece by Stockhausen called Zeklus, which means cycle. And I was I had to crawl underneath the Zymoxil to get to the center, and I had the uh, instruments in a ring around me, and I had uh, I had everything that I played, every note I played was written down on sheet music, and it was spread out on large boards all the way around the circle of instruments. And I stood there and read what I played, and it was about two and a half minutes instead of ten minutes for the Stockhausen piece. But the uh, the most difficult part, I think, for me was trying to play the exact notes as they were exactly written on the paper. And uh, we did a run through, and I said, uh, "Okay, you want to record now?" And he said, "Well, I recorded that one." And so I went in the, in the control room and listened to it back and said, that's it. You know, so it was a first take from the, uh, uh, what I thought was a run through. I didn't even think it was, you know, the finished Yeah, product. no pressure on you at that point. You're just... Uh, I thought it was fine. Yeah. So I thought it was good enough to leave it. And that, what you hear on the record is the, the run through. And that, uh, to me, that was good enough for, to be. Did you actually try to do it a second or third no, time? No, I didn't even do it. You, a second okay, or third wow, time. that's great. It was fine. Harley Cloud in the Sky is one that um, it really we recorded that live. There, there were no overdubs on that, if I recall. I played a the two string. It's it's kind of like a banjo sound. I played it in the uh, in the I don't know. Maybe we did overdub a bow on that also, but very. They had me go to into uh, uh, echo chamber 
which I was thought was very cool. Yeah. I mean, this room on one end was probably that's how it was done in eight the old feet, days. It was probably eight feet wide on one end and came to a point at the other end. The ceiling was like twenty feet high. Cool. So I sat in there on a stool with my headphones on, and I played that two string. I played a slide on it. It's a real bluesy sounding song. It, with Chris was in the studio when I was in the echo chamber. And uh, it, the interesting thing about it is there's no vocals on there, but I remember sitting in the in there, and, and he was he was micing my two string because it was in the you know, it, it, the acoustics in there were incredible. And before we started playing, I, I said, "What is that?" I was I'm talking to the engineer, and he goes, "That's you breathing." He said, try not to breathe so loud until we start recording. That's how sensitive that mic was in that room. Part, the pardon my breathing. It was just, I could hear myself breathing in through the microphone. Yeah. So uh, that, that song to me is Americana. It's kind of front porch bluesy sounding. Yeah, I, I just like to add, I, I think that a lot of our songs... You know, it's not mainstream music. A lot of people have said, well, this is very strange music. And yet that song is just two people sitting on a porch playing the blues. Right. How could you get less controversial than that? Yeah. is a favorite piece of mine of a lot of them. It, it really it's kind of got a dark feel to it absolutely uh, it's got a real heavy bass line that carries the whole song and then all the other instruments are coming in around in this this bass line one of the things that uh, Chris had this gyro gyro that he made out of PVC pipe and it, it, Chris would drag the stick on this Euro. I say Euro, it's called a Euro, I think. Uh, Something like that. But the, he treated it a little bit by no making, the, the, by making uh, the pitch changes. And when you hear that in the song, it almost sounds like some otherworldly animal growling. Does he use a pitch shifting uh, effect yeah. on it to bring it? Now, and it, and it, it and one of my favorite stories about that song is a personal story is years later on Halloween I would play Moonlight and there was another song we did that was pretty eerie I would play that through speakers out front for the little kids to hear this <laughs> because it's a little it's a little spooky it sound is, it is. It's uh, a, uh, it, I like it though I really like the way Moonlight came out Music for Home Bell Instruments has a distinctive cover, and uh, I think a lot of people, if uh, when they bought a Hollis Schwartz album, that might be the one they picked up first because of the images on the cover. And you want to say anything about how that came together? Well, oddly enough, and I've used uh, those pictures of all those tiny little pictures of all those 30 plus instruments, and uh, actually, the, the way that all evolved it came from was the uh, Rolling Stones album Exile on Main Street. That's what that album all cover always looked like to me. But instead of all the circus people and all on the original Exile album, it's the instruments. The instruments were that album. Yes. Uh, Robert and I were there, but the stars of that record were the instruments. The reviews we got for that were real surprising. Yeah, in a you good way. Uh, Option Magazine. I still got some of those Option Magazines and those reviews. I like to go back and read them. 
it, it was funny for me to read about myself with someone saying that Robert Hollis and Christopher Schwartz are the cutting edge of experimental music in America. Oh, wow, that's a great that wow. Was, uh, that was a Dean Suzuki. I, I, it was either Dean or somebody else, yeah. but, it, but I think it was Dean Suzuki. When I read that, I'm like, okay. And Option Magazine back then was, right. was prestige. Yeah, yeah. So that's well, I'll a, see a nice magazine. So uh, I time. wanted to bring this up. So how important was uh, the the community of college radio fanzines and and mail order, which was predominant back then, pre-internet days? Well, it was our it was our internet, and we couldn't have done it without the college because we weren't we weren't on Warner Brothers, we weren't on Asylum, Electro, we we were not going to get reviews in Rolling Stone magazine or Spin. Uh, but we did get great placement on CMJ. We were number one on the college charts, uh, on, on radio stations in Atlanta, but also New York, California, all across the country. Uh, we were getting airplay. It was amazing that we were getting airplay. Yeah, yeah. We, we were getting played in Germany, France, Spain, France, South Germany. Africa. You would receive correspondence letters from them. Right. Hundreds of letters. We, we, sent, uh, we sent product. Uh, we didn't sell a lot of things, but we sent product uh, to in Europe, uh, uh, England, France, Germany, uh, USSR, Czechoslovakia, Israel, Venezuela, Brazil, Japan, uh, as well as 38 states of the 50 in the United States. So we, you know, uh, we were very low budget. We would do it yourself, but uh, we really did get some uh, product out there to some people. That's what we were trying to do. Eleven by two, which was the third and final Hollis Schwartz record. Um, this this album, you did made the decision to stay with the home builds, or was it a hybrid album also? No, it was all home built. It was. You, you stayed in that mode, okay. I talked it over with Robert, and we seemed to agree at the time that, uh, that the, the first album had done well. Uh, but the second album had done, with just the home built, had done even better. So he said, well, let's do one more with, with just the home built. Okay, and this is um, in 1980. In November of 88 was when it was finished and released. Okay, it was released in 88. Because 87 okay. was, remember January of 87, we had the big snow, we had to put off the recording for That's the right. second album one day. That's right. Because uh, because of a snowstorm in Atlanta. Was that the, the famous uh, the, snow jam? No, no, that was 82, 82. But there was, Atlanta gets a good snowstorm every now and then, and we had that in 87 with the second album. But we got the third album done, 11 by 2, we got that done in 88. I, I thought if you buy, if you spend your money to buy a, a record, you should get something with it. Okay. And I based the, we had folded open and had a pouch for the record and a pouch for stuff. And uh, it, it was all based on the, the album by The Who called Live at Leeds. Yeah. When okay. you bought the original, not later copies, but when you bought the original vinyl for that, you got them playing at Woodstock and all these different little pieces of paper and everything. And we did the same thing. We were fined by the government for being late on some payment and charged 10 cents interest. And uh, we had a map of all the radio stations we sent to things and all, lots of different stuff. In, in the oh, yeah, a little more value for your, uh, your right. shopping dollar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. side two was not only the best song Robert ever wrote because he wrote that by himself and I just added percussion but he, he also the best playing that he ever did on the six string guitar and the 36 string uh, electric zither and uh, I, I think that is 
where Moonlight was a standout on the second album, I think Utigaral was a standout on the third album because it was not people banging on things in the kitchen. It, this, this was actual, this was music, and it was well composed, well recorded, and I think probably the best thing Robert ever did. I, that's an unusual name, Utigra. Uh, how did you come up with that? Actually, I think that's just a, it's, it's taking the word guitar and throwing the letters in the it's air. An anagram. And, you know, okay. It's an anagram. I mean, okay, unusual it's just, it's, spelling. Of it's, it's guitar. Scrambled but, guitar. It's scrambled. <laughs> Was that that was some incredible guitar on that on that song? I think it's one of the best things. Yeah, it's, it's, and, and I think if you look you Tigger up somewhere, it probably is some kind of wild cat in the mountains <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs>
in various venues that Perimeter Records was dealing with also. So, um, and that album uh, had a good airplay in Atlanta. I know I heard it quite a bit on R.E.K., but uh, I think uh, it, it definitely got out into the marketplace. Well, in Europe, because it was pretty much the, the connection with, with Jarbo being on it. Right. That she, later with, with Swans, they became a very popular band. And I had, for years, I would have people asking, writing us, they were just interested in the third, in Nine Underground and, and what she had done on it. I think my favorite piece on there was by the Pillow Texans. And it was like an early version of that. It was an early band. version of the band, yeah. We did a Lenny Bruce thing that was a spoken word thing and we set it to music. If you're familiar with Lenny Bruce, the comedian, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, it was a, we didn't use the home builds very much on it because that was '86, probably. Yeah. yeah, that was '86. The home, and as you mentioned, the home builds, great, made great records. Logistically, they were hard to move around. Oh, geez, it was it, so it, much it, trouble. It took an army of people to move these a lot of work and time to set them up. Right. And, yeah, and then and then if you're playing in a club, he's got the same problem the guy in the studio. Right. Man, you how do you mic these things? That's right. <laughs> But um, do you recall any other uh, performances you might have done? The Ruth Laxon show? Remember the Ruth Laxon show? Okay, that was in her backyard in yeah. 1989. 89, summer. What do you remember birds of that? Chirping, hot. It was humid. hot. Uh, what I remember about it is uh, Bruce Hampton was there, and. I forget who was performing or speaking at the time, but I wasn't, and so I was sitting at her out, outside table with Bruce, and there was a very, very large bowl of, of uh, peanut brittle in the middle of the table. All right. I just remember Bruce commenting on how wonderful the peanut brittle was, <laughs> and Bruce and myself proceeded to eat the entire bowl of peanut brittle <laughs> by ourselves. That's I, my that's my one big. I was I, listening it, to the recording and I hear you talking in the background and I think that was cap. You, you know, you and Bruce having at that ball. It, <laughs> it was. <laughs> and we took a lot of instruments down that night. I I I was a surprise. Now when I think about that, I took the glass rack, which is very fragile, and other people I don't even know are playing this thing. Nothing was broken, you know. But we, we took a lot of instruments and, uh, and and a lot of people did a lot of music that night. It was, it was a fun episode. to ask about the annual Perimeter Records Christmas compilation tape. That's a mouthful, but that's essentially it was the annual Christmas tape. And so the first one came out in 1987 and there were seven consecutive years of the Christmas tapes. And uh, it was essentially you, Chris, the, that put that together. Uh, what was the genesis of the whole idea for it? Well, uh, the idea came to me that uh, in Chris, near Christmas uh, 87 that we had 
uh, the ISO album had been out for a year. We'd been getting some good reviews, airplay all across the country, various places, and I wanted to do something for these people that had done something for us. And uh, it was a Christmas gift. And so we, the first one was just a few of us, you, me, Todd Plaharski, uh, John Kincaid, Brian Lilge, that uh, did uh, some material and put it on a cassette. We could run as many as we needed. It was very inexpensive to do. And we mailed them out to all the radio stations. And uh, we kept doing it. And as time went by, uh, I was always surprised by Sometimes people liked it, what we had done on the Christmas uh, thing is as a free giveaway. They liked it more than some of the recorded things on, on vinyl that we were putting well, out and the other people's uh, cassettes that were available on, on print. It was intended to be a promotional tool it was for a, the well, record a promotional label as well. tool, yes. Because you would mail out the catalog with the Christmas tape and yes. it would come in a, a, a full-size a gallon bag, a Ziploc bag that it contained other goodies. Again, like 11 by 2 later, it was designed to have little humorous things. They had a napkin and a candy cane and various things inside of it. Uh, I remember I gave the, the second annual one to Bruce Hampton and immediately he took out the candy cane. He said, I'm going to eat this. So he was probably he was interested in that as the tape. But uh, we, I, I wanted people to get something and, and, uh, uh, as, as a gift. And uh, that, was, that was the whole point. Okay, and I think a lot of people remember the Bill DeSanto as being their favorite. Uh, right. Inclusion for that uh, particular year. The Lego is building the same. Yeah. 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 Submissions. I uh, was at similar to like Nine Underground and that people wanted to be on the Christmas thing. Once it grew. It, it did. And, and more and more local musicians were involved each year. So when you put the word out that you were looking for submissions, did you give them any kind of guidelines on? Uh, that it has to sound a certain way, or uh, it, was there anything in particular? I, I, I asked them to do something that in some vague way sounded Christmas-like, maybe using sleigh bells or something like that, uh, to do a cover but their own version of a, an existing Christmas song, to take a existing song, which John Kincaid was really great about doing, take an existing song by a, uh, by a known band and changing the words to make it a Christmas-oriented song. Okay, well, I was wanting to lead into that because whereas, Robert, you were not involved in the very first Christmas tape, um, you know, all the subsequent ones, I believe you were. Yeah, I don't yeah. know if I came in on the second one or not, but it wasn't long after that. I do remember the song Chimney Creeper that I wrote for one of those Christmas tapes. Which uh, was a lot of people's favorites. Uh, uh, that I, actually, I actually got contacted through the, uh, by email from some folks that, that were actually covering the song. Their band was doing that song. New York. Right? I, th I, I think it was they were from New York, but I, I thought that was pretty good. And Chimney Creeper was a real... Uh, the intent of that song was Santa Claus may not be who you think Santa Claus is. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's uh, dressed up like Santa Claus, so he, how can you he, tell? He, he, and he's going to come down your chimney, and that might not be bringing prizes and stuff. So, <laughs> Chimney Creeper was kind of a dark song. It was, it was uh, the bass line in that. It's kind of dark and moody, but it was very... Tongue and cheek. Yeah, it was, it was very popular.
was so big. Oh, how did I roll the pig? I went and rode the pig. I rode the pig, pig. I went and rode the pig. I rode the pig, pig. It's kind of like a train. For those who don't. The Pink Pig, Ride yeah. the Pink Pig. Right. It, and that, was, that was based on the, there was a kid's ride at Richie's, Macy's, or what, Richie's, or Macy's. Richie's downtown, and Atlanta. It, and the Pink Pig was a ride that went around over the ceiling over the toy department. and Only at Christmas and, time. Uh, only at Christmas, so I'd actually wrote a song. I mean, a lot of people don't even know what the Pink Pig was. but So yeah. these songs were actually performed by a group called My Evil Twin. And um, My Evil Twin was the house band, more or less, for Perimeter Records. It's a good the way to describe it. Right. Because right. every house year uh, uh, we all got together to uh, come up with at least a couple of things. And some of those, uh, um, as you said, John Kincaid uh, was definitely instrumental in steering us towards, like we did the Rolling Stones cover, where we all did background vocals on it. And <laughs> And, and for years, far people, away eyes, far away eyes, yeah. Right. For years, people would ask me, "Where's the the latest Christmas tape?" You know, and we hadn't yeah. done any perimeter for like a decade, and they were still asking me, uh, "You got a Christmas tape?" You know, it, it was very popular. With well, a lot there of was people. a lot of work involved in putting those out every year and oh, getting boy. the materials together and bagging yeah, them right. up. And when you're submitting the contribute to it, you're doing this in July. You know, or <laughs> it August, started in and, July, and getting people yeah. to start thinking about Christmas and that yep. time of year is hard. Yep. <laughs> but um, yeah, the last one went out in 93, and shortly after that, I got transferred out of Atlanta. I was living in Dallas, and- did one more in 96, right? I returned in 96. We did one more in 96. Well, when when we resumed uh, doing it, uh, it was under the Outer Loop banner at yes. that, right, that yeah. point, and that was fine. And I, I did want to kind of continue the, uh, the idea, but it, it died after the second tape. But uh, so we got about ten years of Christmas tapes minus two years where they. It's a good been ten years. Time. Yeah, and uh, and I think y'all just got about six or eight new copies of those '93 when they were in that box. Oh, <laughs> well, there's there's uh, so. So you've got, we've got some of those out there. If yes. anybody wants to listen to a 93 Christmas set. Well, I'm, I'm sure all the radio stations <laughs> still have it in their archive right. and, and bring them out every Christmas. Speaking of archive, one, one thing I want to point out is that Chris sent all of our records to the Library of Congress. Okay, and, so and, you uh, listed there. We're, we're, he made sure our stuff was sent to the Library of Congress and we got back confirmation that our records were at the Library of Congress. Okay, so it's legit. All of the four vinyl. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys for uh, uh, allowing me to make this documentary on the history of Perimeter Records and uh, uh, may ask you for uh, additional contributions as we get a little deeper into this process. But uh, That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. It's kind of fun to go see myself out on the internet. So. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> we got we to dredge up some videos. <laughs> so there's a, there's a paltry amount of that. but. Uh, we do have live recordings on you performing at Live at Rec, and, and those will be included in this. So. So, that's great. So. Well, thanks, Doug. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Doug, for your time.